The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 659 for Sunday, May 28th, 2017. Good readings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show. Are you sending questions, tips, cool stuff found? We share your questions, answer your tips, share your cool stuff found, something like that, reversed, switched around a little bit. But the point when we get together is for each and every one of us, you, you, that guy, and me too, to learn at least four new things. And that's what we're going to do today here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here. And sunny, fearful Connecticut, John F. Braun. How are you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Couldn't be better. Well, we could all be better, but uh, pretty good. That's good. That's how it should be. That's uh, yeah. We get to have what two days of spring before it, uh, for the seasons change and it becomes summer again. I think so. It's crazy. It's crazy, John. But we have some tips, and I I think. I think I know how to start this one off. Elliot sent in this tip. He says, am I the only one who never thought of this before? And and I'll tell you, Elliot, you are not because I didn't think about this either. Uh, if there are particular system preference panes you need to access on your Mac frequently, you can drag a shortcut to a particular preference pane f- preference pane from system library preference panes to your dock, desktop, or wherever for ready access. And then you just click on it and boom, it opens system preferences right to that pane. Very, very cool. So if you're messing around with network a lot or something like that, you know, where you're just constantly in there, man, just good to go. Good to go. That's where they're located. Yeah. Now there's a, so I did not know that, but, but I will share an ancillary tip. If you have system preferences in your dock and you right click or control click on it in your dock, you will see a list of all of your preference panes and you can get right to them from there. So not quite as efficient as Elliot's tip, but certainly related. I wanted to make sure everybody knew. So there you go. Thanks, Elliot. Oddly enough, oddly enough, you know, you would, one would think you could just drag it from the system preferences box into the dock but apparently that is not an option correct you need to go into the system library uh preference panes folder to do that that's right and take that raw file yeah now, one and thing just you make can an alias do to yeah. so a heads up for people and don't move the file just make an alias to it right right, right. i mean I, I know that sounds obvious but we're saying yeah go ahead now, john the yeah. other tip boy we're just full of them <laughs> we're full of something so if, uh, if you do have a preference pane that you no longer want um, and you are in system preferences, uh, most of them, maybe not the system ones, but if you right click, you will then get an option, remove whatever the preference oh, pane right, is. Oh, right. For third party preference panes. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. I don't. Well, yeah, because yeah, you probably don't want to remove like network or blue. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that might cause some issues. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, All right. Good stuff. Cool. Uh, in the cool stuff found department, Michael says, I wanted to pass on a very cool iPad app called liquid text at liquidtext.net. Having recently completed some grad work, one of the necessary experiences was reading large amounts of papers, usually available as PDFs. With the goal of not wanting to print any paper, I also needed to have a solution that provided easy markup and note taking. Liquid text was by far the best app I have come across, says Michael. Well, what it allows you to do completely eliminates the need to ever print paper again. I just wish that they had an OS 10 version of the app to allow me to share the markup seamlessly across platforms. Very cool, Michael. Thank you for uh, for sharing that. Good stuff. Yeah, I haven't used liquid text, but now I kind of want to. I need to, I want to find a, a reason because it sounds good. Yeah, good stuff. As far as I know. Yeah. As far as you know. Uh, and I believe lastly in the Cool Stuff Found Department, but I'm not sure we might find something else as we go through the show. Jim shares with us. He says, uh, I'm not sure how this works, but it would look, it looks pretty cool. It's called the Bit Defender Box. 
And what this does, I, I know Brian Chaffin just saw them at uh, a Pepcom event out in San Francisco, and I'm hoping that we'll get to see them at a Pepcom event here in uh, in June in New York, John. But this Bit Defender box is a piece of hardware that sits between your router and your cable modem, as I understand it. And it is doing on the fly filtering or or monitoring, I should say, of your connection so that if, say, you had an Internet of Things device like a webcam or a printer or something that that wound up getting, uh, you know, compromised and became part of a botnet, this thing would and or could and, and should and would see it and stop that or alert you or whatever. A few months ago, I published an article uh, talking about how routers could protect us from these Internet of Things botnets. And and this device effectively would do that same thing. Um, it, but it, it's not your router. It sits past your router. And and their claim and, and not an incorrect one is that by being a separate box, it can also protect you if your router gets compromised because it's sitting there between all of that stuff. So I haven't tested one of these, but, uh, but I was aware of it and it's 130 bucks. Um, pretty cool little thing, but, uh, they right now they're saying it's only supported by windows. I'm not, I'm not even sure what that means because it seems like it's just a standalone box, but maybe, maybe there's some configuration software that's not, uh, not Mac compatible yet. Huh. Yeah. But it looks pretty cool. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting idea. I, I still feel like the router manufacturers are in the unique position to do this. But what I will say is that this kind of thing takes a lot of CPU horsepower because it's doing real time inspection and or filtering of every packet that comes through. So, uh, so it's going to have to be, you know, the, the whatever box it is that's doing this or whatever device it is that's doing this is going to have to have some some horsepower to it. But um, but, yeah, it's an interesting thing. So. I'm going to have to look to my pile of goodies. I seem to recall somebody giving me a box that did something security wise. I huh. have to see if I got one at one point. Just it's in the queue. There you go. There you go. But yeah. Yeah. Cool concept. And I, I I'm eager to check this one out. So. Thanks for, thanks for hipping us to it, Jim. You want to take us on to Kent, John? Yes. Good one from Kent. Oh, uh, all right. Kent says, I'm listening to Mac Geek Gab 658 today in the discussion around Ari's unreadable photos on the SD card. I don't know if this will help, but Lexar has its image rescue now at version 5, that is supposed to recover lost files from SD cards of any brand. Sometimes it comes with the purchase of a card, but it looks like it can be purchased outright for $33.99. Might be worth it for 1,500 photos. And you know what, Dave? That's a great suggestion. And I actually looked on my machine, and I actually have a copy of it there. Oh, there you go. Why do you ask? Because I bought a while ago a couple of, uh, I think, 32 gig Lexar SD cards for my uh, my digital camera. Huh. There's something funny about it, though. Um, so I activated it and like my, many pieces of software, they uh, they reach out to the Internet to uh, see if there are updates or uh, you know other things. And I think there was a minor update since I last ran it. Um, here's the weird thing though, Dave, um, using my pal Little Snitch. Yeah. It wasn't going to Lexar.com for the update. It was going to ProsoftEng.com. Oh, interesting. Now, you you may say, well, that that's crazy talk. Why would they be going to ProSoft Engineering? And I think I know why. Well, they're either hosting it or it reminded me that there is another piece of software that... um. I have that does something similar that I haven't used for a while. Um, and so I fired that up as well. So they have a product called Picture Rescue. Pro, ProSoft has a product called ProSoft, Picture Rescue. Yes, so ProSoft yep. Engineering. Um, and I actually looked through 
my notes and actually have a license because they like us and we like them. So they actually sent me a license to it at one point. So sure. that's, and, and they look very similar, uh, both from the UI. So, so again, I don't know if they're licensing. I mean, I looked in the Lexar software and it didn't say license from ProSoft. Sure. So I don't know if they licensed a, a portion of it or, or what, but um, those are two pieces of software that claim to be able to um, fix your corrupt, the photo card. Huh. Okay, the weird thing cool. is that I think one of the programs, it, it was funny. So I didn't have an SD card in, but one of the programs that I ran, Dave, um, actually showed my uh, SSD as a device that oh, it was willing to, um, well, because it's it flash is, memory. Yeah. It is in a sense, a big memory card, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, different. Yeah. Yes. But yes. Yeah. I said, sure. Why not? I would rather software like that be more inclusive rather than less, because the last thing you want is to have some maybe slightly different memory card or something where you put it in and the software just won't see it because it says, nope, this isn't a picture card. So I'm not going to try. But yep. And to wrap it up. So under the wire, this came in after you would put the agenda together, Dave. So, yeah. Um, but I noticed this email because every now and then I look in our uh, inbox to see right. what's there. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. And <laughs> and Darren uh, writes in and uh, and he said uh, regarding corrupt memory cards, my cousin had the same issue with a memory card for her digital camera. It was being and being the go-to tech geek in the family, I was charged with attempting to salvage the photos on the card. After trying numerous workarounds and recovery programs, the one that worked for me was Card Rescue. Okay. And I'll, I'll paste that URL in the notes. Sweet. Um, and it managed to retrieve about 95% of the corrupted files. There's a Mac and Windows version, and the Mac version is currently, oh, what? Oh, look at that. Uh, 35.94 pounds. Okay. <laughs> but it worked for him. So, sure. um, so we got three options. Um, hopefully, uh, that'll work for Ari or other people who have uh, apparently photos getting corrupted is something that happens more often than one would like. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it's memory cards They're You know, it, it's, I've, I've always, well, I mean, we always say one place, you know, having your data in one place is, is not having your data. And, and I don't know, I've always had weird things with long-term storage on, on memory cards. So I don't know. This is good. Nice to have some some options. And uh and pretty cool that that little snitch sussed that out for you, man. I still use uh I still only use little snitch when I'm not at home because I because I don't like the interruptions and I don't want to train myself to just ignore the interruptions. Oh but, boy. Uh, but I but I use them are you you're saying oh boy about little snitch or you're saying oh boy about uh the, the sirens. The oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um uh, but, you know, I, I do use little snitch. I have two little profiles, one uh, for when I'm tethered to my phone and it limits a lot of my bandwidth usage. And then the other when just when I'm traveling, which blocks out any sharing services like, you know, photo sharing or iTunes sharing or file sharing or anything like that. So cool stuff, man. All right. I just like it because you see who your computer is talking to. Hmm. No, I get that. I just, I, I don't have time in my day for that level of granularity. Um, yeah. 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 All right. Uh, also a follow-up from 658. Allison wrote in and said, uh, I just heard, this is Allison from uh, the NoSillaCast at podfeet.com. Uh, just heard the guy talking about his fan problem on his older iMac. I had a runaway fan problem a few years back that I couldn't figure out the root cause of for probably three months. Finally, she says, one of my listeners suggested that the vents had gotten clogged with dust. 30 seconds after spraying with compressed air, my fan problem was permanently fixed. Thanks for sharing that, Allison. That's um, that's handy advice. Because yeah, dust vents can act as an, well, block the vents or sure. if it's on your components can actually act as an insulator. Oh, that's and, true. It might not have been the vents, right? It, it could have just been dust sitting on on one of the sensors and insulating it. Uh, and I think both you and I have seen this, but totally. especially um, if you can at all avoid it, if you are a smoker, right. Don't smoke near your computer because smoke makes it even worse. Yeah. 
There's a lot and of I reasons think, not to smoke, but uh, but yeah, that's yet but, another one. Yeah, but it 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 makes the dust problem worse. And I've been inside machines where it's a oh, yeah. smoker, and uh, it's not pretty. No, no, it it's not. It's and it's a different kind of dust. It's it's actually yeah. It really kind of starts to form almost a film. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Okay, uh, let's see, Andy. Let's go and uh, we'll we'll jump into some questions here. And he says, uh, I initially bought an OWC Thunderbolt two dock after your recommendation. And it's been bloody brilliant. And he says from across the pond recently updated my MacBook Pro to the new 2016 MacBook Pro, which has all USB C ports with Thunderbolt three capabilities. So I pre ordered a Thunderbolt three dock from OWC a few months ago as they were due to ship at the beginning of April. They obviously have had some issues with manufacturing as now the shipping date is estimated to be the beginning of June. So my question is, should I just continue to wait for OWC's Thunderbolt 3 dock, knowing it's probably going to be the best on the market, or should I look for an alternative? Having to use single adapters for HDMI, USB 3, Ethernet, etc. is becoming a pain, and I'm worried that the shipping date of beginning of June may become end of June, beginning of July, etc., the only Thunderbolt 3 dock that I know of that's available is the CalDigit uh, TS3 line. They also have a bigger and better unit available soon, but not yet. So he says uh, the Elgato Thunderbolt 3 dock coming soon. Belkin Thunderbolt 3 Express coming soon. Any ideas are welcome. So I think, it, you know, we're seeing the same thing from all of the folks putting together Thunderbolt 3 docks that they're just not able to get enough parts is what I would assume. I don't know this for a fact, but uh, given that everyone is delayed on being able to ship one of these things en masse, my guess is it's that, uh, you know, some, some component of it, perhaps even the Thunderbolt three chip is just in short supply and probably will, will be available soon. Uh, so that's slowing everybody down, but, uh, but I don't know of any others that are, that are out there. So I, I don't know that you have another option, but, um, you know, based on my testing with, with Thunderbolt 2 stuff and Thunderbolt 1 stuff, I've had good luck with um, all four of those vendors. You know, I, I currently in my office, I have the OWC Thunderbolt 2 dock, and then I have the CalDigit TS2 up here in the studio, and they both work great. Uh, you know, it, they do what they're supposed to do. And especially here in the studio, because it's a 2011 iMac, I get a lot of capabilities that I just don't have on this machine, including USB three. Um, so, I, it, you know, and they've they've both worked flawlessly for me for years. So I, I think you're going to be OK with any of them. Really, what you're going to look for is what does it have the ports that you need? And, and we're all kind of different in that regard based on, on what we need to do. So. Uh, I think I think you just got to wait it out, man. I don't think there's a uh, I don't think there's an answer yet. There's, there's none available that I know of, at least not in the way that you would want them. So, so there you go. Thoughts on that, John? I'm not yet on the Thunderbolt bandwagon. Really? <clears throat> yeah, believe it or not. Huh. All right. Well, hey, up until recently, because I live in the past, I, I wasn't even on the USB three bandwagon. Well, but. that's true. Yeah, but now I am with with my two machines. So, uh, but yeah, I don't have any uh, any Thunderbolt uh, peripherals. Right. Well, that, that but that's of. how I that's how I got on the USB three bandwagon with this machine. Like I said, it was you know Thunderbolt. It's a great expansion method, and I I, I look forward to Apple supporting it more and more. I want to see official support for external graphics cards and and all of that. Right, because. You know, that's a good point because more than one person has noted that the graphics performance of Macs aren't necessarily equal to their PC counterparts. I was speaking well, and it's 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 that uh, you know you're you you want to be able to use those NVIDIA GPUs, but you can't because they aren't available. Um, I was speaking with someone the other day who develops software in house at uh, at a fairly large company. And he was telling me that he develops on his Mac, but the fast he does and he does a lot of stuff that's GPU intensive and it runs faster on the iPad Pro than it does on his Mac, which is interesting. 
And it's because of the GPU that's available there. So, I mean, he does all his development and sort of testing of the software on the Mac, but when he needs performance, it's the iPad Pro. Hopefully Apple can change that for us. They said they, they've kind of hinted that they would, but really, like I said, what I would like to see is Apple just say, hey, if you need extra GPU performance, you know, use one of these third party uh, Thunderbolt, you know, expansion chassis, put what, you know, whatever card you want in there. And yeah, I mean, because that, that works, right? But Apple hasn't has been sort of tight lipped about saying like giving that the thumbs up and so the the obvious concern is you're going to invest in this thing that's going to probably cost you you know five to eight hundred bucks or whatever and then you know and then apple's going to change something in the os that makes it unsupported or whatever so it'd be good if apple kind of gave us a thumbs up on that but anyway we'll get there okay moving on to a whole different concept robin it says, I have a few questions about the mobile apps folder. My daughter is running low on disk space on her Mac. And when I used Daisy disk, it reported 66 gigabytes of files in the mobile apps folder, plus 30 gigs in backups. I have deleted several very out of date backups, uh, which have freed 20 gigs. But that 66 is a huge amount of potentially wasted space. He says, I also checked the drive on my computer and my mobile apps folder is 50 gigs plus. My daughter backs up her iPad and iPhone to the computer. So I'm assuming I cannot delete the mobile apps folder on my computer. I back up to iCloud, but I also do a manual backup to my computer as a belt and braces job. Do I need all these gigabytes of files? So the answer is no, you don't. Um, and even if you're backing up your iOS device to your Mac, you still don't need to back up all the apps to your Mac. You don't need to download those apps. Now, I, I say that and, and I should put a huge, huge asterisk on it because what will happen if you don't have those apps is you will need to re-download them from the App Store. And that's all fine and good as long as they are available on the App Store. There are some apps out there that Apple has um, conveniently retired for their developers uh, or the developers themselves have retired and taken out of service. And sometimes those apps are available for download for people that have previously purchased them, even though they're not available for new purchase, but other times they are simply not available from the store. That's a pretty rare thing, but it happens. And if they're not available from the store and you don't have a local copy, you cannot put those back on your, on your device. That aside the only downside to not having them local is that they have to be redownloaded to your device as opposed to just copied over from the local network. But if you're not worried about bandwidth and, and the time it takes to download, uh, then uh, there's no reason to keep all those mobile apps around. I keep mine around, but you don't have to. I just do it because I've got a lot of storage and I'm crazy. Uh, so here's uh, what you can do. It, here's the here's the problem, though. It, you may have told iTunes to copy apps from your device. You may have also told it to automatically download apps that you've purchased. So um, deleting the contents of the mobile apps folder is one thing to do. Don't delete the folder itself, but delete the contents of it. Then go into iTunes, preferences, downloads, and uncheck the box for apps. That way it won't keep downloading new apps that you uh, purchase from the store. Number two, go into iTunes preferences advanced and click the box that says reset warnings. And the reason you want to do that is because the next time you back up your uh, iTunes is going to ask you, do you want to cop? There are apps on this device that are not on your computer. Do you want to copy them over? And you want to say, no, uh, chances are you've said yes to this in the past. And that's why partially why those apps are getting copied over. So doing those two things and then saying no to, uh, to that prompt should keep your mobile apps folder from filling up for you. Thoughts on that, John? No. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. I've never really, yeah, that, that, the space being taken up is not of no concern to me. <laughs> do you now, do you store your iTunes stuff 
locally, like on your internal hard drive, or do you have an external hard drive that that it winds up getting saved to? Um, the internal drive. Yeah. Okay, but you have a big monster internal drive, and you're not worried about the storage. Yeah, I got a one terabyte. Got yeah, it. One terabyte SSD. Right. Right. So yeah, so I my uh, phone. So I it both backs up to the cloud, and then every now and then I'll do a manual. Backup sure. As well. Sure. Sure. You also want more than one backup. Well, right, right. Yeah, I um, I know, and I guess I've started doing this too. But um, Adam Christensen over at MacCast hipped me to the concept of backing up your mobile apps folder, but doing it in a versioned way, so that if you wind up with a version of an app that like crashes or does something you don't like, you can go back through the old versions and actually install an older version. If, if iOS will, you know, if, if it's compatible with your current version of iOS, which is cool. So, you know, it's good. Good question, Robin. Thank you for that. If anybody else has any tips or concepts that they employ to, uh, to manage that stuff. We'd love to hear about it. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Uh, did you say feedback at MacGeekGab.com, Dave? I did. I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Unless you're a premium listener and premium listeners that support us directly get access to a special premium at MacGeekGab.com address. And, uh, and I do want to thank our premium listeners this week. The, uh, the folks. Well, I want to thank all of you that are premium listeners. And specifically, as we've been doing, I want to give a shout out to all of the folks who either signed up new or renewed their uh, premium subscriptions this week. So at the uh, $25 every six month level, we have Andrew D, Patrick C, Terrence G, Stephen S, Paul C, Peter E, Brent G, Paul D, and a new one, Monroe R. Thank you to all of you. At the monthly $10 level, Nick S., Elizabeth B., Michael P., Chris F., and new to that mix is Jim E. Thanks to all of you for supporting us. And a one-time $25 contribution from Charles M. this week as well. So thank you. You all totally, totally rock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome stuff. We really couldn't. We couldn't do this without you. So it's a... it means a lot, and I know we say that every week, which hopefully doesn't reduce its meaning uh, in your eyes, because it certainly doesn't in ours. Okay, moving on, John. Do you want to take us to Felix? Sure. Absolutely. All right, great. And Felix writes in and says, hi, guys. I have a client who is having trouble downloading via FTP. The connection keeps timing out just before completing a download. Is there an app slash tool I can use to troubleshoot where this issue might be? Um, and the question is, is it, is it the Wi-Fi connection? Is it the other person's FTP? Uh, I'd appreciate any suggestions. Well, so first off, what's FTP, you may ask? What's FTP, John? <laughs> <laughs> so FTP is file transfer protocol. It is a, just a note here, uh, non-secure if you do it on its own. But uh, it's a way of transferring files from one place to another. Yeah. And you actually have that functionality built into the Mac, Dave. So if you want to go to an FTP server, uh, it, it is uh, something that integrates with the Finder. So, so there are a couple options built into the Mac. Um, one, you could just go to... Uh, so yeah, if you go to the Finder, let's see, go connect to server... You could then type in the URL, FTP colon slash slash and the address of the server, and then you sure. should get prompted. Um, or you could do it from Safari and it'll say, hey, I should hand this off to the finder. What do you think? And you can say, yeah, sure. Um, but it doesn't give you a lot of detail um, about what's happening. Okay. Um, you, you could also do it from the command line, but that gets kind of rough because uh, FTP talk isn't uh, necessarily very straightforward. And then you have to learn to FTP talk. And, and who has time for that? Sure. So, right. I mean, if you do type FTP from the terminal, yeah, you'll connect to the server. But then what? Um. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it's, and it's not that hard. You're using get and put and things like that. But yeah. Yeah. And they're diagnostic. And, and you, you can get the spec if you want to do that. Um, 
in that case, though, you would see, you would probably get some level of detail. But um, like I said, who has time for that? Um, my suggestion, Dave, would be to get um, an FTP utility that offers you um, the best of both worlds. Okay. Um, and actually, my favorite, Dave, uh, I haven't used it in a while, but um, and I like it for a number of reasons, but uh, it's called CyberDuck. That's been around for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a client that does not only FTP, but it does SFTP, which is secure FTP. It does WebDAV, Amazon S3, Backblaze, Microsoft. I'm just looking at their page here. Sure. One do- I mean, it's crazy, all the things that it talks to, but it does do FTP. The nice thing is that you can look underneath the covers, which was the question. How do I see the raw data exchange and messages that are going back and forth and perhaps the error messages as well. Sure. And they do offer that. So within Cyberduck, if you go to the review menu and then you say toggle log drawer, you will surprise get to see the raw log data. Which All right. Is, I yeah. think what he was asking. Yeah, I think so. so um, yeah. You want to see what's, what's transpiring between them. So yeah. Plus it's just, like I said, I mean, it has like every protocol I know of or, or, Quite a few. So it's a very nice uh, client for doing file transfer as well. Cool. Um, a couple others for those of you that uh, want to and need to do FTP. Uh, Andy in the chat room, as will run for fun. And the chat room, of course, being at MacGeekUp.com slash stream is uh, recommending FileZilla, which appears to oh, be yeah. uh, a, an open source. It is. It's a free FTP uh, solution. It, the the client is available for all the platforms and that's what we're talking about here is is just the client so that's uh, available we'll put a link to that in the show notes uh i am a big fan and use regularly uh transmit from panic that's a paid for ftp client but it man it's so smooth i, I use it constantly because we're ftping things around for various servers and and such and uh, it's got great integration. It syncs all my bookmarks so I can have things saved and it goes to all my computers and all of that stuff, which is great. And then lastly, I think InterArchie, I-N-T-E-R-A-R-C-H-Y is, uh, wow, that was an interesting little audio hiccup. It's being recommended by Kiwi Graham in the chat room too. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Very uh very inter, very interesting stuff. Yeah, good, John. Yeah, and I'm sure uh, buried in all of them uh, is a way to uh, look underneath the covers. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I know with with transmit from Panic, it um, it does it no problem underneath the covers. So it'll let you see all the logs, which is good. And and you had mentioned the Finder in in our chat room, Alex. Uh, commented that the FTP from the finder is limited to read only. So if you're just retrieving data, it tends to work just fine when it mounts in the finder. But, and I think he's right about this, that you can't upload stuff if you, um, if you do it from the finder. So, huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. So for those of you that need to upload, you do need a client and, and your recommendation of CyberDuck would absolutely do that. You need a server too. <laughs> well, but you need a you need a server for for connecting for read only stuff as well. I was actually struggling because I don't have one. Though of mm. course you could set one up on, uh, for example, Synology lets you set up an FTP server if you sure. do that sort of thing. Sure. Um, but I was actually I actually had to spend a few moments trying to find a public one. Um, mm. I remember Apple used to have one at FTP.Apple.com, but they no longer do. And right, right. Because right. why? <laughs> well, I mean, that's how Apple. So it's right. The, the history of this and the reason FTP is is an insecure protocol or the reason we say that is because your username and password are and all the transfers are sent in the clear. It's not an encrypted connection. So you got to be very careful how where and how you use it. But um, but it started as this is how Apple would distribute their software updates online. I mean, prior to that, you'd get a disc that you could get in the mail or, you know, whatever. 
But when they started doing it online, ftp.apple.com is where you would go to get your software updates. And it was the coolest thing ever because you didn't have to wait for a disc. You could just download if you had the time. Um, obviously, the world and, and our Internet speeds or our bandwidth speeds have changed now. So we're able to do that and we don't even think about it. But this is this is where it all started. That's how that how that began. So it's fun stuff. Uh, all right. And now jumping all over the place because that's what we do. We keep it interesting. Jumping to listener, John, who asks, is there a Mac app out there that I can use to chop up a long 90 minute audio file into shorter length files? Yeah, there's a lot of ways to do this, but there is one that for me floats way to the top of the list. And that's rogue amoebas fission. And the reason Fission floats to the top of the list is because Fission lets you do this without having to re-encode the file. So if you're doing this with a, a raw piece of audio, like an AIFF or a wave that is uncompressed, it's no big deal, right, to, to chop up the file because the, the, it, the file doesn't have to, the format of the file and the compression of the file doesn't have to change. But if you start chopping up files that are, say, MP3 or, you know, AAC, generally what software does is it decompresses the file, chops up whatever you need to, and then takes the segment that you're kind of resaving and re-encodes that. So you've got this double lossy thing that's happening because you're taking data that was compressed and then compressing it again and and losing some quality there fission is magic it allows you to edit audio without recompressing it it does it in its original form so you you are able to maintain the maximum quality or the original quality i should say of the file that you're starting with so that i i like fission for that and it's very very easy it's a simple little interface if uh, if and when we ever have to edit, you know, something in the podcast, if there's like a little hiccup that's that's too much to uh, to leave in there for you folks. Fission is the app that I go to. Uh, the, the UI is just simple and, and really easy. So that's my uh, that's my answer. If uh, John. I, yeah, I have an answer. Yeah, I'm going to get all audacious with you. Mr. Okay, Dave. Okay, um, I'm going to suggest audacity. Okay, another uh timeless um, piece of uh, software. It's a, uh, yep. Free open right. source, right. Um, Windows, Mac, GNU, Linux. Um, when I've had to do audio work, um, such as cutting up a file, um, it's something it can do. I, yeah. I, I think the UI may be, uh, well, it, there may be a learning curve, right. As right. with many pieces of audio software, but um, that's another option. And, yep. uh, now, Audacity will not do this editing losslessly, right? It 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 does it the the original way that I described. It decompresses it. You do whatever you want to do with the audio. You export it, and if you choose to put it in a in a you know back into an MP3 format or something, it will you will lose quality by by doing that round trip. So uh, that. That's probably true. No, it, that is 100% true. I, okay. I, I, yeah. yeah. I, I use Audacity all the time. I mean, it's a, it's a great piece of software. It's not what I would choose for this just because it converts. First, it converts to wave. You do your editing and then you could, you know, reconvert hmm. it back to MP3 or whatever you want as your, as your export. So, but yeah, yeah, for free. I mean, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. All right. Uh, let's see. Where else are we here? Uh, you know, actually, before we leave that, I have a question. And maybe this becomes a geek challenge. Um, again, Adam Christensen and I were having this conversation earlier this week. How would you do that? How would you answer that same question for video files? So let's say I have a video file, a movie or something, and I want to edit out uh, a, a, a clip, either because I want to just have a clip of the, that video or I want to chop out a piece of it and, and leave the rest of it whole. What, what would you use? What would you use to do that? John? Um, I'd go pro Dave. 
Yeah, so we talk no, the QuickTime Pro, but I mean that's QuickTime 7, right? So QuickTime 7, um, yep. they had a Pro and I actually yeah. saved the key and activated it at one point. <laughs> right. Um but I believe that lets you do um do that sort of thing with uh with video files that it understands. So It does. Yeah. Now now my question is what currently exists that lets me do this? <laughs> And yeah, I know you can still run QuickTime 7 Pro, but that's, yeah. So I'm I'm curious what what exists out there to do that. Yeah, I'm not a video type of guy, so I... Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's a, it's, it's a, it's an interesting question. Fission for video would be great. But, uh, because it would be great not to lose that quality and time in the round trip of converting out and back. So, uh, final cut. Oh no, they don't make that anymore. Do they? Yeah, they do. Movie. I movie. Apple makes final cut. Okay. They haven't killed it off yet. No, no, no. I'm sure about it. Oh, not at all. No, no. Actually, I think even aperture would let you do very basic video editing. Um, of course that is no, no, no longer exists. Right, right, right. But how about, uh, does iMovie let you edit? iMovie would, but it, again, okay. it's, it's lossy. All right. Yeah. Uh, somebody in the chat room suggested FFmpeg, which is a command line um, workhorse, really, that kind of does all kinds of things. I don't, I don't know if you could do this losslessly with FFmpeg. Huh? It wouldn't surprise me if you could, though. Huh. Oh man, FFmpeg. You know, I hadn't. U- I actually did use that, or I rather used a. Uh, well, they had a GUI front end to it, so I think underneath it all, it's a. It, it can be a command line utility. Sure. But I actually used it to recode videos that had too high a bit rate mm-hmm. for my then PowerBook G4 to handle. <laughs> Right, right, right. <laughs> and then I wanted to bring some videos to a friend's house and I wanted to, you know, play them on his, uh, and I wanted to play them and, and it stuttered. I was like, what's wrong with you? It's just the processor was too wimpy. So I'm like, well, how do I solve this problem? Well, right. let me, uh, let me, uh, huh? let me reduce the, uh, the bit rate uh, or bandwidth, if you will, of the, uh, of the video. And uh, that did it. All right, so if you need to do anything with FFmpeg, I I uh, just read Andy in the chat room suggested a tool called IFFmpeg. So it's at IFFmpeg.com. It's a GUI for FFmpeg. And just based on what I'm seeing here on the website, it looks awesome. I, I mean, very, very Mac-like. So uh, this is what I would, it, It's it's a, it's a for pay piece of software, but I think it's like, it's less than 20 pounds. So, you know, less than 25 bucks, I guess. Um, built for trimming movies. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it's, it's just a, and I don't want to dismiss what they've done here, but it, it's a front end for FFmpeg at the command line, which to be fair is what most of Apple's tools are too. Right. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff in OS 10 is just gooey for stuff that you can do at the command line, as we've been talking about FTP and all that other stuff. So, uh, but this looks great. So yeah, I got to check this out. Good stuff. Nice. Find nice. find. I like this. See, yeah. we're learning new things all day long here. The one I used, uh, they haven't up to, nah. I used a front end called FFmpeg X. Yeah. And I think that still exists. It does. I, it's I'm not on their page as pretty right now. Yeah. I'm on their page, but it has n- the, the latest project news is in 2011. So oh, it may so maybe still it, work. Yeah. Okay. So it's not actively developed as far as we can tell. All right. Yeah. As far as but we can still tell run. quickly. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, right. it's an interface to, yeah, to the, 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 uh, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Todd. Todd writes, um, oh, he, actually, this was just a follow up, but but I figured I'd put it here because it, it's sort of related. We were talking about iTunes album art in the last episode and how to fix all that. And Todd's suggestion, he said, OK, so tune up might work 
which is what we talked about last episode. But he says MP Freaker is his tool of choice, and it will do all of that stuff because it uses Grace Note at its core, which is uh, which is a sort of a universal database of all this stuff from Lairware.com. So MP Freaker, we will put a link to that in the show notes too. Thanks, Todd. Good stuff. I like it. Is good. Yeah. Good, John. It's better than bad. It's good. It's better than bad. It's good. All right. On that subject, David writes and asks, he says, uh, I maintain an iTunes library of a few thousand songs, which I often listen to ever since iOS 10 came out. I often can't find the lyrics to my music, at least not on my devices running iOS. All my songs do have the lyrics added because I put them there. As I add newer songs to iTunes, I always include the lyrics as well. My older Nano has its own OS and the lyrics are still visible there. They are also on, still on my laptop, although iTunes now refers to them as custom lyrics. I know where the lyrics are supposed to be when a song is playing in iOS or paused, I suppose. When I tap the playing song and it expands, I'm supposed to be able to tap on the red dot 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 at the bottom right corner of its window. But the lyrics selection isn't available on my tracks. Mostly, the only options are delete from library and add to a playlist love or dislike. I don't use Apple Music or iTunes Match or anything like that. I add all my own music and I have no need or desire to stream music wherever I go. I sync my iPhone, my iPad, and my iPod to my laptop, and my music is available wherever I am. A few months ago, I researched this and found a semi-solution that involved essentially deleting all my songs from my iOS devices and then resyncing them back from iTunes. That did work for most of my music, although it did not work with all tracks. I have no idea what the distinction was. I suspect Apple would love to have everyone migrate over to its paid streaming service. I see that they have disabled the Genius Playlist service on iOS, for example. Do you believe they are chipping away at other iOS fe features like the displaying of lyrics to aggravate people into switching over? I don't think they're working to aggravate people, but this is interesting. Um, when I, I so I, I use Apple Music, but more specifically, you know, iCloud Music Library, which is a, a a feature of Apple Music, but that's probably the one we're talking about here. Um, and that's where my lyrics come from. But I do notice that they often take a second or two to appear. And to me, that tells me they're coming from the cloud. Um, but but they do make it there uh, generally, generally when uh when i'm when i'm working with stuff but um yeah i don't i don't know the magic answer for this john do you have any uh any thoughts on on where the the lyrics come from yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh that would be a no that would be a no yeah yeah it's it they, because for me it's it's the same experience sometimes the lyrics appear and sometimes they do not so it, um, yeah, I don't, it, it's a, it, it's not a consistent thing, um, when, uh, when it's there. So, or, or, it, you know, I don't know. It's, I can find them usually, but not always. And I, I, I grok the frustration. So maybe this becomes a geek challenge. Maybe somebody, uh, can send us their thoughts on how they consistently get the lyrics to appear to a song. Cause that would be, that would be handy. So geek challenge. We told you how to find us before via email 206. No, it's not. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling the old number from memory, John. It's two, two, four, eight, eight, eight geek, which is four, three, three, five. Thank you, sir. That's good stuff. Yeah. Call us and let us know. We'd love to, uh, I'd love to, I, I, I'd love to find a consistent way for this because I've, I've looked into it and it, it just never seems to, uh, and I, I, I can't find it consistently. So somebody did put a, uh, tech note in the show notes for us that says when lyrics are available with an asterisk, you can read them in the music app on your iPhone. Um, and to do that, when listening to a song, tap or swipe up in the player at the bottom of the screen uh, to open now playing to the right of lyrics tap show. Yeah. Well, there you go. 
it doesn't always appear. It's kind of the issue. And you can do it on your Mac or PC as well. Uh, while listening to a song, there's the, uh, it's, it's kind of like the hamburger menu that, that appears at the top of the iTunes list, but it's not all the way over on the left. In fact, it's closer to the right. It's, it's between the shuttle controls for the, like where you are in the song and, uh, and the search box. And if you click that, you can see up next history and lyrics. So that's where that should appear. But what do you do when the lyrics don't appear? That's the question I would like to get the answer to. So, yeah, good stuff. All right, moving onward. I don't think we have anything else on that one. Francois brings up a very timely topic. He says, uh, there's a problem I have with my iPhone 6 Plus, And before restoring the beast, I'm asking you. I regularly start applications by using the spotlight search from Springboard or from the home screen. Um, I swipe down from the top of my screen, type a word like Safari, and then the application appears and I can tap it. This helps when I have lots of apps on my phone and I don't want to scroll through to find one. I do the same thing, Francois. He says, but it does not always work. And uh, four out of five times, there are simply no results that appear. It's very frustrating. He says, I tried disabling all that I can from spotlight search settings, but that doesn't work either. He says, also, I tried to delete network settings. Any advice? And he says, by the way, this only happens on my iPhone. On my iPad, it works fine. So I have experienced this same problem, Francois. Uh, and it's not consistent to all my devices, but it's not just my phone. It's not just my iPad. I've seen it kind of come and go on, on different devices. In fact, there have been periods of time where the most reliable way I can search and launch an app is to open the app store and search for the app there. And then because I have it installed, instead of saying get or purchase or sorry, get or buy, it says open. That's not the most efficient way to do that. Um, I have found that it has been better for me, though, since the 10.3.3 update. Now, I'm, I'm not yet convinced that 10.3.3 actually fixed this problem, though. I think it might have to do with the fact that an OS update, A, restarts your phone, and B, also likely wipes out a lot of cache files and things that can get corrupted. Uh, and that may well include the Spotlight cache, which, of course, is very much related to this. But your advice about, or your, your sort of advice in passing about disabling things from your spotlight search results uh, has resonated with a lot of people. There was a discussion earlier this week about how folks were having exactly the same symptom, Francois, and they found that disabling Slack from their iOS search results uh, helped solve it. Others said they have the problem and they've never used Slack. So, but uh, so it's it's likely not just Slack, but it might be one app. I've what I've found when I when I've experienced this, sometimes nothing appears. Sometimes it takes a really long time for something to appear. And that leads me to believe that the spotlight index is just getting overloaded with lots and lots of data and perhaps keeping it from uh, parsing some of that data might be helpful. Slack being one of those things, but but not the only one. So. My advice is, and this is good for, for many reasons, go to settings, general, spotlight search, search results, uh, which is sort of at the bottom of the spotlight search list. And you'll see all of your apps there and you can decide whether or not their content will be displayed as part of your spotlight search results. But just like on the Mac, I'm not convinced that this turns off the indexing of that content. I think it's still all indexed but it certainly turns off the display of it. And whether or not you have this problem, turning off the display of unnecessary content in your spotlight results can help surface what you want. Like for me, I just the way I use spotlight and the way I think about it, I would never use spotlight to search for my contacts. So I have always turned off contacts from appearing in my spotlight search results. And that way, it just doesn't get in my way as I'm searching through and, and finding other things. So you can be very efficient about this. I generally, especially now, 
go in there and I've turned off almost everything and then only turn on the things that I actually want to see in those results. And, and I, I wish there was a way to say disable all and then let me go back in and, and just turn on the ones that I want. But alas, that's not how iOS works. So you just get to sit and it'd take you about, you know, a minute to go through and turn them all off. And then, and then you can turn on the ones that you want. So thoughts on this, John? Hello. I saw I saw a good tip about that the other day, which yeah. is well to find grain. You can find grain. What uh, what data comes up there? Yeah, right. That's the yeah. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. And Alex asks a good related question in the chat room: If mail and messages is turned off, will search still work in mail itself? And the answer is yes. Uh, I have always had mail and messages off. Again, for the same reason. I if I want to search mail. I will go into mail and search that, but I don't just need that. I don't want that cluttering up my results. So, um, so yes, I, I can guarantee you that it still works inside the mail app, which also supports my previous thought that spotlight's still indexing this stuff. Even if you turn off the display of the results in that particular list. So there you go. Yeah. Good stuff, mm -hmm. John. Any, did I cut you off? Is there, was there, was there more nope. that you were saying? Okay, cool. All right. Devin has, uh, again, taken us in a different direction. I love all this stuff. Devin says, I'm pretty privacy and security conscious when it comes to my data. All of my data with, in drop. Uh, he says, I have all of my data with it in Dropbox. And while I do trust them, he says, I have two factor authentication enabled and I still keep my most private of documents, financial stuff, tax stuff, passport copies, social security card copies, etc., stored in encrypted disk images. That way I can sync them with Dropbox. But the only person that can actually see the data is the one with the password. And that's me. He says that has worked for years, but I've found the iPad ever more capable. And I plan to do a lot of travel with just my iOS devices. The problem for me is is I often need to edit some of the documents that I keep in those disk images. My questions are, one, is there a way for me to open a disk image or a DMG image on my iPad, edit the contents, and then save them back to Dropbox? Uh, the answer to this, to this question for many years seems to have been no, he says. And number two, if it's still no, is there another way you would suggest handling very sensitive documents that would allow them to be accessible on the iPad, but still leaves the ultimate security in my hands alone? So this is a great question. Um, let's I, I have some thoughts about this, but I believe the answer to his first question, John, is still no, that you can't edit disk or you can't open disk images secure or not on on iOS. Is that still true? Uh, I'll have to play with it. I actually really haven't. Uh, yeah, so, I don't think it does it under. Hmm. No, I don't think it does. You know, because I mean, we had this go around where, um, you know, we were playing with another type of file. And the thing is, you had to pick just the right with the certs, you know. Right. Right. You're saying, okay, well, if you access one through Safari, Safari understands what it means and mail understands what mm -hmm. it means but um other clients do not so huh yeah so the way you know i what? deal with I'm, this i'm gonna try well but go ahead but i'm gonna try something here because okay. i think i have a, a, a resource available in okay front cool of me that'll let me test something all right cool so the way i deal with this is um by using apps that sync data uh, uh securely uh, uh, amongst all of my devices and most commonly, that's for me, that's one password um, I store. So I, I can't store spreadsheets or things like that in one password, but I do have secure notes in one password where I store a lot of the, the types of data that you're talking about here. Um, and that is secured. Uh, so one password actually has a. Uh, uh, categories, I should say, for passports and driver's licenses and things like that. And they're all stored in your secure vault, which is only decryptable by you with your password or by whomever has your password. And, that, you know, I don't want to say that's just you because it could be someone else. But that has worked for me and obviously keeps things very secure. But again, it, it 
your flexibility is limited to that which one password can do. So, yes, you have your driver's license and your passports and things like that. And you can store pictures of them in there and all that stuff works great. But beyond that, really, your option is what they call secure notes, which is just sort of raw text um, where you can store things. And I use that all the time for that kind of stuff, because as you know, you described Devin, it's synced everywhere, but it's synced in a secure way, or it's, it, it's synced, it's an encrypted piece of data that is synced. And then I don't have to worry about anybody else getting access to it. So I really like that. Uh, Kiwi Graham in the chat room is saying, I vaguely recall a product named box cryptor, um, which is encrypt encryption encryption software to secure cloud files. Um, and I'm not, I can't tell if it works on iOS, but maybe it does. Maybe, maybe I don't think so though. I think it's, Oh no. Yeah, it is available for iOS. All right. Well, that's interesting. So there you go. Um, and it's built to do exactly this. It's end to end encryption for Dropbox and and more. Choose your cloud without worrying about safety and who can access it. We handle security and keep it simple, even for non techies. So this is at boxcryptor.com. And obviously we will put a link in uh, in the show notes. So this might be that magic answer so that you can. Uh, my guess is this, this, you know, it's, it stores its own, it's not probably not doing a DMG, but, uh, but doing, you know, whatever it's secure blob of data is. And then it, it sort of parses through that and pulls out the files that you want and you edit them and, and then I guess, save them back with this. I haven't obviously haven't used it, but, uh, but very interesting. And it is priced at, uh, there is a free version that allows one cloud provider and two devices. And then you can, for 50 bucks a year, I think you get unlimited cloud providers and unlimited devices and so on and so forth all the way up. So, wow. Nice find Kiwi Graham. That's pretty good. Um, but Dogster's saying it was last updated in for iOS uh, February of 2014. So... That might or might not be as magic an answer as we thought, but it does have 64 bits of support. So it's not going to be one of those apps that stops working whenever Apple drops support for 64 bit for for 32 bit apps. So maybe, maybe it has what it needs. I don't know. Interesting stuff. Very, very good. So John, how does your, how has your experiment been going here? I was trying to, uh, <clears throat> play with disk images with various clients here and uh gonna have to keep trying okay i tried through dropbox um and also safari interfacing to dropbox and it kind of knows what a dmg is but then when i try to do something it's like well like yeah preview not available oh got it it okay. thinks about it for a while and it tries to do something but it doesn't display the contents or yeah or let me edit it so yeah keep trying on that one you want to take us to melinda here while we're on the subject of uh securing your your data and that sort of thing yeah sweet i think this is a good one all right so let's um all right hi dave and john love the podcast thank you we love you too <laughs> and i always appreciate learning at least three new things every time i listen <coughs> excuse me Clear my throat here. Uh, get some liquids. I'm a longtime listener with a first time question. My question is Can my ISP see or access content files and apps, etc., on the computers or devices in my network when I'm using my ISP's modem and router exclusively? My 2012 airport time capsule router recently went out, according to my ISP, when I contacted them for a service call after I was without internet. For about four days, the first three incidents were apparently due to my ISP's technical issues, but the last occurrence was the fault of my airport time capsule router, according to my ISP. They offered me a free router to use with their modem until I purchased the router I really want. I'm currently renting the, the uh, modem, which consists of a small power over internet device that connects to the router inside. Outside cable runs from the inside. Uh, Speak okay, up, John. I'm just looking. I don't think this is relevant. Okay, so, um, got it. 
Okay, my current network consists of two 2012 iMac desktop computers, one 2013 Mac Pro, along with my wireless printer, iPhone, iPad, cell phone, booster, extender, and... Okay, because I listen to Mac Geek App, I'm well aware of security versus convenience issue when using any device online these days, but I'm concerned that my ISP can now monitor every single device that runs through their router. My suspicions were especially raised when I found out I cannot set the router password unless I contact my ISP to do so, and that they can remotely reset and monitor my router if I have any more issues with service in the future. The plus side is now my internet is working just fine. It's quite possible that my old time capsule was on its last leg, and I plan to purchase a new router, uh, Eero, sounds good, in the immediate future. Um... All right, that, that, that I don't think is relevant. I use my VPN tunnel bear when working online, especially when I deal with client files or my personal banking, etc. My internet is down. I go into town to the nearest coffee shop where I can work online by tunnel bear, of course. And I think that about that's the question, Dave. What's that's the question? The big question. Well, I think the basic question is um, can my ISP, uh, if I have a device and a router for my ISP, if the question is, can they see what's on my network? I would say that the answer is yes. And that anybody that has administrative access to your router would be able to see what devices are connected using SNMP or whatever they make available to the ISP. And they can probably see network traffic as well as anybody who can administer a router could do, right? Right. The thing is, if they wanted to, um, and as you probably know, there was legislation recently passing that your ISP can monitor your browsing if they want to. Uh, but in both cases, Dave, I would say because they can doesn't mean they will. Hmm. What I could suggest is you look at their privacy policy. Um, you know, as far as the, uh, the you know, harvesting your uh, browsing data, um, at least mine, I'll trust them on this, but... Um, they specifically state, we're not going to do this. And they actually have a whole privacy section saying, you know, we could, but we won't. But they could. And that could change without you being hyper aware. But, but, I, but I don't think right. that's the question, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about, it, it, as I understand it, she's wondering if because you have their router, can they mm -hmm. see stuff internal to your house? Not just the data, regardless of whose router you use. Correct. They can see and the data that's passing right. across. But the and, question is... And I'm going to address that. Okay. All right. So as for accessing content on, on the devices on your network, that's mostly up to you. And that if the device or services it offers has some sort of authentication, which is often used to generate an encryption key... It'll secure the network traffic, you know, AFP or SMB mm. or all that. Okay. okay. So uh, in that case, as long as you protect your, in this case, a file server with a username and password, you should be okay. And that that traffic will be protected. Um, you may just want to make sure, and this is just the general philosophical thing, but you may want to make sure you don't have services available unless you need them available would be another thing. So on Mac OS, you can look at these things in system preferences, sharing, and just make sure you're not sharing too much. Usually sharing is good, but in this case, you want to limit hmm. the, the services you want to make available if, if you're running on a PC or a Mac or your Synology for that matter. Sure. And yeah. I think they even have a, a Synology even, um, even has a security auditor that will tell you, hey, um, you know, yeah, you may not want to have that port open. Hey, your password kind of sucks. Um, stuff like that. Um, what you could do, um, other than getting one of these magic boxes that they indicate will, will look at some of this for you, um, you may also want to do a scan of your network with a tool like Thing. Um, or maybe Nmap is one of my favorites, and that's, that's an oldie. Um, and both of those can identify devices on your network and also probe them to see what they're sharing. Right. I'm actually kind of tickled sometimes. So if, uh, if I'm on public Wi-Fi and, uh, and I see other devices and, and run Fing, Fing will actually let you 
I mean, it's kind of rude, right? But sure. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> but Thing will let you uh, basically port scan the devices that it finds on the network segment that you're on. And uh, yeah, I just do it for entertainment. I'm just like, do you know what you're sharing? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, one time I actually did it on our library's public network, and I actually found that they had a network printer that I wasn't aware of. And, you know, so I asked them, like, hey, you know, can I print to this? And they're like, yeah, sure. That's cool. I'm like, oh, well, that's, that's cool. So uh, sometimes it pays to be nosy. Yeah, um, this, is, this is an interesting question because, it, you know, there's this uh, assumption of safety that exists on your local network. Like, it, you know, you... you want to you want to firewall off your local network from the outside world so that somebody on the outside can't just start sniffing around at your uh you know at your devices and trying different passwords and just seeing what's available but generally speaking once something is uh you know on my local network I tend to trust it but um but that's it, it you know this question brings up an interesting thought that well if you've got a device managed by someone else, i.e. your ISP or anyone on your local network, uh, that's, you know, it, it sort of raises the point that they could be sniffing around there. If they manage that device, which they do, it's your router. It can see everything on your local network and, and it can get a list because it has one of all the devices that are connected to it uh, for DHCP purposes. Right. So, Yeah. I, um, I've always run my own router. I've always, uh, you know, as we've talked about on the show, I'm a fan of running your own router. Uh, but this sort of adds a whole other layer to that, that I'd never really thought about before. Uh, again, y you know, the thing is, does your ISP have time to, to be worrying about what you're doing on your local network in general, probably not, but in specific cases, potentially so. So, yeah. It's an interesting question. Thanks for uh, thanks for making us think, Melinda. I yeah. think I think we have time for one more. Oh, it's, I just want to wrap oh, up the ahead. discussion. Yeah. Here. Um, the other aspect uh, that I think is important here um, to remind people that there are different. Uh, that you, if you can secure whatever path that you're using, you can do that. So one thing that was mentioned, of course, um, is using something like Tunnel Bear which uh, makes me happy because the latest iOS update happily offers 17.4% more bear puns. <laughs> Love their release notes. Um, but also uh, secure other portions. You know, so use WPA2 or a password, uh, if you can, on Wi-Fi. Uh, use SSL or TLS between you and the devices that you're talking to. That also protects the traffic. So even if someone can get on the network, ISP or otherwise, they won't be able to, to see what's happening. Well, course, WPA yeah. is not going to protect you from your ISP, though, because the router gets to see it all. Correct. Right. Yeah, but it'll it'll. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to make the point that whenever you can secure the, right. the various, uh, you know, portions. Right. So if and when you do get that arrow, um, of course, put a password on there. So right, one, right. It, it encrypts your traffic, and number two, people can't can't sneak around or yeah, you know, or if, if you want them on your network, set up a guest network. That's you know, of course, another strategy. Yep. Yep. All right, I'm done. Okay, cool. <laughs> no, it's a good discussion. I, I like it. Um, Larry has an interesting question, um, but it, it, I, I think the answer is, well, we'll see if it's simple. He says, when listening to streaming audio, mostly via MLB.com and TuneIn Radio on my iPhone 5S, everything sounds great for about five or 10 minutes. Then I'll hear a brief sound, almost like an audio tape being rewound as it passed by the playback head. And then the stream starts about a minute or two earlier. Another five minutes or so later, the same thing happens in a classic case of two steps forward and one step back. This can cause a baseball game uh, for to extend uh, when I listen to it. And he says, so what's the deal? It's not the hardware. The phone was replaced a few months ago by Apple for battery issues. And both old and new phone does the same thing. He says, I've also done a clean install of the OS that had no effect. He says, I see nothing on Google and MLB.com's technical support uh, has nothing to say. I'm not even sure where to start troubleshooting. Okay. And that's, that's where I'll stop his question. So, you know, this is one of those interesting things, right? You've replaced the hardware. So presumably it's not the hardware. 
you've done a clean install of the OS. And I'm going to assume that you haven't restored from a backup, right? If you have, then of course there could be corrupted data in the backup itself, uh, but try it without that. But again, just to kind of take this as a, as a bigger thing, when you're having these weird problems with iOS, those are two obvious steps. I mean, replacing the hardware seems pretty severe, uh, but it reminds me about when my son was having a problem with his device. And we, the first thing we did was we, you know, wiped it clean and the same thing was happening. He was having some weird thing where anytime he started typing his, his phone would just blow up and reset. And uh, so, you know, we did the iCloud there. We did the, uh, the restore from, from, uh, from iCloud. Okay. That doesn't work. So don't restore fine. Same problem. Apple replaced the hardware in the store. Same problem. And that's when it hit me like, well, okay, what's the same? It's got, there's gotta be something that's the same. And it's your iCloud syncing, right? When you sync documents and data with iCloud, that feeds preferences to a lot of things, not just third-party apps, but Apple apps as well and Apple services. So if you're troubleshooting a problem, wipe your phone don't restore from a backup and don't sign into iCloud. Apple makes this very difficult. They really want you to sign into iCloud and that's understandable. But for troubleshooting sake, skip signing into iCloud when you first do that, uh, that reinstall so that you can truly test to see if it's the hardware or the device. Uh, you know, you'll download a fresh copy of the app. You'll log in fresh to the app. And, you know, in Larry's case, that's the MLB thing or tune in, test it again and then maybe sync to i or log in and let iCloud do its syncing, see if that fixes it or if that causes the problem to happen again. Um, you can't go and edit the stuff in iCloud on your phone, but you can edit it on your Mac. It, they they've made it more and more difficult to see the hidden stuff there, but you can certainly do it from the terminal um, in the mobile documents folder. So or I guess it's a home library mobile documents. And you can, if you dig around in there, you can see all the stuff and you can delete stuff and hopefully keep it deleted. It is, remember, synced to iCloud. So you, you sometimes might need to delete twice in order to really get those preferences to wipe out. But, um, but I just wanted to kind of remind everybody of that because it's easy to forget that iCloud can populate your device with a lot more than you, uh, than you thought. So any thoughts on that, John? No. Okay. Well, it's time to bring the band in, man. It's it's how it goes, you know, because that's what we do. Yes, yes. Well, we told you how to find us. We told you how to contact us. Find us on Facebook, though. Go to macgeekhub.com slash Facebook and join our great community of uh, everybody that's out there helping out and all that good stuff. Yeah. Thanks to Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Uh, I also want to uh, thank everybody for listening. Thank everybody in the chat room uh, at MacGeekUp.com slash stream for helping out. Thanks, of course, to all of our premium listeners. Thanks to our podcast marketplace sponsors. This month that includes Smile at SmileSoftware.com, Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com, Barebones Software at Barebones.com. We've got some great sponsors coming up for our WWDC content. The first of which that signed up was Gig Sky, so I'm really excited about that. But there's more. Trust me, there's more coming. In fact, there's more that have signed up. Good stuff. Have a great week. I don't know when the next episode's going to be recorded, though. We'll, uh, we'll send out a note because I'm flying to WWDC on uh, next Sunday, John. So, between now and then, I want you all to remember, have a great time. Enjoy yourselves. And, John, do you have one lasting piece of advice for them all? I not only have one, I have two. I, have, I got three words for you. Dave. What? Yeah. And that's don't get caught. Made up.